Welcome everybody to the AHA Real Estate Exam Study Group. Uh, something that we're putting on. We we have been a little lax over the past couple of months. Uh, I've been out of town. We've been doing a lot of CE classes. We did some reformatting on AHA. So I'm not sure when all of you have joined with me. I've been doing this for a little over a year now. Uh, so things have been changing for the better. And because of that, we've been really focused on that. But now we feel like we're finally set with where we want. There's a few other things we're going to be adding to the site. But I um, want to welcome everybody again for that. And going forward, we're planning on having at least two of these every month. Uh, uh, my cohort in crime here, she's on my top left screen. Her name is Sarah Ragsdale, if she wants to unmute herself and and, uh, and introduce herself. But she is my cohort in crime. And so she may, or you will actually see her on at least one or two of these on occasion too. And, you know, it's, she's pretty good. Okay. I mean, let's be honest. She's not me. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so, so Sarah, did you want to say anything to everybody real quick? Uh, no, just welcome. And sorry, you have to deal with him most of the time. Uh, see, that's the, that's the kind of attitude that I get. That's, that's what they call respect here in Indiana. There's that who's your hospitality. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, so what I wanted to start off with actually was an email that I had gotten uh, from somebody and forgive me, I don't remember where she's from. I want to say Omaha and it doesn't, I shouldn't say it doesn't matter. Of course, it matters where she comes from to her. But one of the things that, that she pointed out is, is something that I tend to forget. Uh, you know, when we're going through the study groups and all that and the study sessions, I typically focus on the on the material, which obviously that's what we're going to do tonight and work through that. But I always like to remind people, again, I, I, I'm not a professional test uh, uh, preparer from the standpoint of like, I've, I, there are companies out there that, that don't teach you the topic, they teach you literally how to take a test. And I've done some of that and I've coached people through that. So I preface it that way. But what I wanted to start off with was just to remind everybody that when you're taking the test, certainly the material is very important, but there were a couple of, a couple of tips that she had written in here. And it just was that, that, that gentle reminder to me that I need to remind you guys that when you take the test, these are things we should be doing. And again, I mentioned this on the podcast and all that as well, but one of the things that she mentioned that got her through, this is a student or a, 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 a listener that passed the exam in her state. And the thing that she told, told me that, that worked the best for her was relaxing and breathing. There is a physiological part of your brain that requires that in order to think clearly when we're in a test situation, we have an, and here's where I'm going to sound really, really super smart. And I am not on this particular subject, at least shut up, Sarah, uh, you have what's called your amygdala, which is at the top of your brain. It's that fight or flight piece of your brain that you guys are familiar with. When you are in a stressful situation, that is what is kicking in here saying, oh my God, I want to get out of here. I want to get out of here. And what we need to engage is the, the what's called the prefrontal cortex, the front of your brain. That's the thinking logic brain, the stuff that's going to help you get through this. And the way that we can engage that is by relaxing and breathing because when we do that there's a direct link to the way that it works and again this is not hokey any kind of crazy yoga kind of thing whatever not that yoga is crazy a little bit to be clear but at the end of the day breathing and relaxing breathing in the nose and out the mouth helps you so incredibly much and she made a point to, to, to bring that up because she had taken the test a few times and she knew she felt that anxiety that you guys feel she had this stuff and she was there and she couldn't focus and she remembered that one of the podcast episodes or whatever we talked about it she kicked back she took about four or five breaths took about 10 15 seconds this doesn't take a lot of time but it re-engages your brain so please don't ever forget to do that because you do get that anxiety. And you guys know it. You've taken the class. You've been through the test. You've done this before. If you've already taken the state exam, you know exactly what I'm saying. And when you're feeling that way, you have to take the break. You've got to get your brain back where it's thinking again instead of like, oh, my God, get me out of here kind of a thing. The other thing that she pointed out that, that and I just saw this on another group, too, is make sure you are reading the question. I know that seems silly, but that's what I do when I work through this on the podcast. And certainly as we work through some of these tonight is read through the question. And also in that same vein, make sure you're answering the question uh, of what it's, what it's actually asking you. A lot of times in, in helping people through this, 
they understand the topic, they understand what they're asking, and they got the wrong answer, not because they didn't know what it was, is that they didn't read the question properly. They weren't answering it. They just either just assumed what it was asking or whatever. So again, take your time to read through this. Make sure that you're reading through the question, that you're understanding what it's going through. Uh, because again, a lot of people will miss a question, not because they don't know it, but just simply because of the fact that I thought this is what they asked. And when you go back to it, it's like, oh, I knew that. I knew this, not what it was asking, but you just gotten so big of a rush. So the last thing that she had mentioned in here is, <clears throat> again, this will also help with your stress level, if you will, is that when we're reading questions, you're going to have between four and eight possible answers, depending on the question type. So one way to help alleviate your anxiety is to eliminate the ones that are obviously wrong, that you know are wrong. So that does a couple of things. One, it relieves your anxiety. Instead of thinking through four answers, like, oh my gosh, is it A, B, C, or D? I know the answer is not C and D. It's A and B. So now I don't even think about C and D anymore. I just stop thinking about it. That way I, I, my brain knows that now I have two options. So it re relaxes a little bit more on that side. And then also still too, now you've, by, by doing that, you've also uh, uh, cut your, uh, uh, rather increased your chances by, by 100% because now it's a one and two question or maybe one and three, whatever it is, but eliminate the obvious answers and just forget about them. Think, okay, it's A, B, and C and not D. So now I'm only thinking about A, B, and C. So again, that just kind of helps with that anxiety. The last thing that that I got asked, and I've got asked this like five times this week. That's why I'm only bringing it up. And the and the answer is I don't have an answer. A lot of people have been asking me how many math questions are on the exam, and I do not know. <laughs> the reason I don't know is because it depends on when you take the test, what day it is, and what test you're taking. In Indiana, we use PSI. Some states use Pearson View, and I think there's a third one out there that some of you might use as well. <clears throat> they all basically work off of the same premise, though, and I've taught in all three of them uh, or worked with all three of them. So I have that basic familiarity. And the reason I bring it up is that every one, every test uh, testing center that you go to, they have usually anywhere between five and seven tests that they hand out. And even outside of that, each of the seven tests have like a, around about 500 questions each, which obviously you're not getting that many but they'll have a pool of questions. And so depending on which day it is, what test you're taking and the particular randomization of the test, you might end up, I've had students have said, I had three math questions. And some of you are like, oh my God, I wish I could get that test, right? I wish I could get the one with three. And then some people have said they got like 14 and 15. And you're like, holy crap, I don't want, want that one. Some of you might be the opposite. I would be the math person. I'm the math nerd. Please give me the 15 math test. And I would love that. Some people don't, but just, there's not a, a rhyme or reason to it. So, so don't set yourself up trying to figure out how many math questions you might have. Because if you took it today, maybe you're going to have four. And if you take it again another day, it might be seven. It might be 12. It might be two. So just wanted to answer that because I did get a lot of that in there. So anyway, um, getting into questions now. Again, I'd mentioned, I see, a, 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 a Phil, you, you, you uh, um, put a question up in here for me. Um, if you have any questions, any topics that you'd like for me to go into, go into the chat. Like I say, I've got plenty of content here to go through. And certainly if I bring up a topic that resonates with you and you want to go into it deeper, let me know. We can cover that. But uh, if there's any particular topic that you want to get into, just type it in the chat and we'll get to it. So the first one that I have is, is one that uh, uh, um, talks about contracts. There's a lot of contract questions. And before I get into the question, one of the things that's gonna help you a lot with contract questions is to remember that there are a lot of pieces with contracts. And so some of the things that when people go through the contract questions, they're thinking about a different topic altogether. For example, and that's what this question kind of, or not, sorry, not this one, another one I'm gonna cover here in a little bit, is that you probably are familiar or remember something called a bilateral versus a unilateral contract. Now, I'm not going to get into that right now because we'll cover that here in a, a little bit with another question, but you'll remember that part. And then along with that, then we start talking about what makes a void contract or a voidable contract, which is what this question also gets into a little bit as well. And so then you start thinking, well, voidable and unilateral kind of mean the same thing. And they do, but they don't. You have to keep it all in context. So when I'm going through this question, I've got another one for you too that deals with that. 
we kind of have to separate that a little bit, that there are some of these pieces that do, <clears throat> excuse me, interweave, but most of the questions are not going to do that to you. They're going to be pretty straight up. Like this is a voidable issue. This is a unilateral issue. This is a uh, agency issue, whatever it is. It'll usually be, it, I would say it's not specific, but the way you think through it needs to be that way. So this deals with terminating a contract. Which of the following, uh, uh, the question is, which of the following will not terminate an offer to purchase a, a real estate? So basically what it's saying is that we have a buyer and seller that have entered into a contract to sell this piece of real estate. And they're asking which of the following will not terminate. The other reason I like to bring up this question is that here's where we have to turn our brains around on this as well, because it's saying which one of these would not terminate the offer to purchase, not which one will, because we're all naturally inclined to choose the positive. We're looking for the one that does not work. So which of these will not terminate a contract? A is death of the offer or offeree. B is conditional acceptance of the offer by the offeree. C, revocation by the offerer after being notified of offeree's acceptance. And D, failure to accept offer within time stated therein by the offer E. So I would normally ask what you guys think, but I know I went through that relatively quickly. So let me just answer it for you. The answer, excuse me, to this is answer A, death of the parties. That will not terminate this contract. Death of parties does not make a contract go away. And so many people think that because the buyer passed away, because the seller passed away, the contract is over, and it is not. Now, again, this is where I dive more into the reality of it and all, and there's probably going to make the contract go away by, by some virtue of the fact that the buyer can't buy now, they can't get financing. But with regard to the contract specifically, death of either party does not automatically terminate. In fact, I will just speak to it this way. There have been several instances where, and we've dealt with this even in our office, where the seller passed away during the listing, during the sale, and the property was still sold. That listing contract did not go away. It went through. Now, were there complications? Yes. We had to get with the heirs. We had to get with the attorneys. We had to go through court. It was more complicated, but the contract does not go away because of death. So that is the answer here. Now, answer B said conditional acceptance, that conditional acceptance is not termination. It's saying that I accept this as long as you do this other thing. So that is not a termination. That would be a form of a counter offer, if you will. C says revocation of offer after acceptance. You cannot revoke an offer. Item, item C is not even possible. You can't even do this. Revoking says, here's my offer. You accepted it and now I take it back. You can't do that. So answer C was not right. And then answer D, failure to accept offer within the time frame. That's another one. But again, here, if that happened, if D happened where the thing wasn't completed in the time frame, then we don't have a contract. So there's nothing to terminate. So in this situation, the only answer here is death. And that's the one that most people think that that's going to be the first one that I would say would terminate it. And actually, it's not. Uh, so answer A, the one that will not terminate a contract is death of the offer or offeree, the, the buyer sell in that situation. So that hopefully helps you with that one a little bit. Now, this next one, again, these are all over the board. These are just various questions that people have sent to me or put on the Facebook group or whatever. So they are completely random. This next one deals with leasing of property. So to, 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 to kind of cover this real quickly, what we want to recognize is the difference between what is called a gross lease versus a net lease. And the main pieces to pay attention to with both are who is responsible for various expenses, such as uh, uh, utilities, maintenance, things like that. With a gross lease, the landlord pays all expenses. They take care of all of it. And, and just the general theory of it, gross lease, the landlord pays for all the expenses. So what this does basically for the tenant is that the tenant pays one amount. They pay, they pay rent. And that's the only thing they have to pay for. And that's one of the key pieces of this question is that right there. And I'll circle back around to it. 
A net lease is the opposite of that, where a net lease, the tenant typically pays for all or some of the expenses like utilities, maintenance, things like that. So remember those two things. I don't have a good memory or a good memory tip. I mean, for me, when I think about it, gross means all so when i'm looking at the landlord's perspective the grow the, the gross the tenant or the, i'm sorry the landlord pays all that's gross to me when i'm thinking of gross versus net um net is is that the landlord is getting a net amount they're getting the 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 the, the, the rent without having to pay the, any of the expenses it's not a great memory tip but that's just kind of the general idea of what i've done with that so the question goes like this a person is willing to pay $100 per month and nothing more to rent a space in a garage. Which of those leases would be most appropriate? Is it a net? Is it a gross? Is it a, 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 a group lease or an index lease? Um, and the answer here is very simple because the question tells you, not directly by definition, but it does tell you that this tenant only wants to pay that one fee, that $100 per month and nothing else. Out of the two leases that we just talked about, and there's only the two really that we're worried about here in this case, the gross lease is the only one where the tenant pays that one fee and nothing else. The landlord pays the other fees. A net lease, which is one that a lot of people chose in this situation, a net lease is where the tenant would pay the rent as well as other fees. And the question specifically states, I am willing to pay this $100 and nothing more. That flat out just tells you by definition, this is a gross lease. So that's what that is. Um, <clears throat> Molly, I see that you typed in, uh, here's my question, joint tenancy versus tenancy in common, simple I know, but I keep making, mixing them up, uh, any suggestions? So Sarah, uh, since you're here, ma'am, I know that you have a favorite memory tip for keeping joint tenancy and tenant in common uh, straight in your head. So I'll let you chime in here and share your thoughts and I'll be, I'll be happy to, to add my own after. Yeah, way to call me out on that. Well, hey, I mean, you're the one that's the druggie here. Wait, guys, you wait till you tell you. Tell, tell, hey, wait till it's she tells legal you. in some states. It is, okay. In some states. Lizzie, I yeah, think. Yeah, California. Hey, you guys are state. good. Colorado. Yeah. <laughs> um, so my memory tip is with joint tenancy. Um, remember, you don't have that right of survivorship. So you cannot pass on your part of um, ownership to anybody else. It automatically goes to the remaining owners. Um, so my memory tip is, is that you wouldn't pass a joint onto your kids. So you cannot pass your joint tenancy onto any of your heirs or your kids. So that is my memory tip to try to keep them separate and to remember the difference between joint tenancy and tenants in common because a joint tenancy, whether you're um, and remember with joint tenancy, your ownership has to be equal. And so you cannot pass on your equal ownership onto anybody else. It goes on to the remaining owners where with tenants in common ownership doesn't have to be equal. And you can pass that on to your kids, your heirs, your mom, your dad, your brother, sister, somebody else, or you can sell it off you don't need permission from any of the other owners. So that's my memory tip. And she is not judging anybody that is passing a joint to the kids, just so that we're clear on that. If you want to do that, hey, it's your house, just so that we're, we're clear on that. <laughs> but normally maybe you wouldn't. So that's her point. No, the, the, my memory tip is actually not as fun. I just simply think that as a joint tenant, we are joined together. We are inseparable. Where tenants in common, we are not joined together. We own the same thing, but from a, a legal standpoint, as tenants in common, we do not share anything together. My ownership is separate from you. So when I think of joint tenancy, 
What we're saying here is that as a joint tenant, we are joined together. Our ownership is joined together. I am not separate from you. We are one one unit, if you will, even though we're two or three different human beings, whomever you know the parties are that own this thing. And then it has that right of survivorship. And why that's so important is that there are, there are many questions. In fact, even in the real world, we deal with this. I mean, this is a an excellent question, Molly, because you will absolutely deal with this in the real world where you have these situations situations that when an owner passes away, they cannot, they cannot put it in a will to pass it off to somebody else. If I owned a piece of real estate with any one of you and we were joint tenants and in my will, I say that my part of this property goes to my kids or my wife or somebody else. My will does not supersede the joint tenant because as a joint tenant with you, we are joined together. I am not separate from you. I cannot control my part all by myself. So I cannot give it to anybody else. I can't put it in that will. I can't handle it that way. Uh, so that's my general idea of how I keep them straight in my own mind. Uh, and certainly as Sarah kind of pointed out, there's other pieces with regard to the technical aspects of it, of that right of survivorship uh, to, um, you know, that, equal or unequal ownership. Uh, uh, certainly when you're talking about joint tenancy, you're probably, you remember the, the acronym PIT, P-I-T-T, uh, unities, of, of, unities of possession, interest, time, and title, or some of you may have learned it T-TIP, T-T-I-P, so I've heard it both ways, but um, that's the easiest way uh, other than smoking a joint like Sarah does apparently all the time uh, <laughs> to remember joint tenancy. All right, the next question I had deals with contracts as well. So it goes like this. A broker has a property listed for $225,000, an offer of $210,000 contingent upon inspection comes in and the seller accepts it. So just reframing that real quick, property is listed 225, Buyer comes in, says, I'll buy it for 210 with an inspection ins contingency. And the seller says, okay, we accept it. Goes on to say that another offer, so this is a second offer, comes in uh, at $205,000. The seller accepts it as a secondary backup offer, which is perfectly fine. You can do this. Um, but they have to get termination of that first offer to make that happen. The question goes on to say the first offer or demands the seller spend $5,000 in repairs before going through with the purchase. So again, restating this question, first buyer offered 210, said I want an inspection done, seller accepts it. Second buyer comes in says I'm offering you $205,000 without an inspection. Um, and then the first buyer says, I want, after this inspection, I want $5,000 of repairs. So the question is, what can the seller do? I'm sorry, that's not the question. <laughs> let me let me heed my own warning earlier. The question asks, the seller may do all of the following except. So which of these can they not do? The first one is agree to do the needed repairs and complete the transaction with the first offeror. Can they do that? Of course they can. Hey, seller or hey, buyer, you want this stuff done? I'm going to fix it. We'll complete the transaction so they can do that. That's not our answer. We're looking for the one they can't do. Answer B, ignore the demand and sell the property to the second offeror. There's a problem with this. You, in theory, you can do this, but there's a problem with the way that it's stated, which is ultimately what makes this the correct answer here. And we'll, we'll get back to that. Answer C says terminate the first agreement in writing and then sell to the second offeror. Can they do that? Yes, they can. We do this all the time too. Have an inspection. I'm not willing to fix that stuff. I'm going to terminate my agreement with the first buyer. Hey, second buyer, let's go forward. So they can do that as well. Answer D is refused, excuse me, refused to do the repairs and still proceed with the sale and as is condition. Can they do that? Yes, they can. Yes, they can. They can refuse to do it. And the buyer says, that's okay. We didn't really want the $5,000 of stuff anyway. We're just asking. Let's go forward with it. So those are all the things we can do. So the answer here is B. And what makes B wrong 
is that it says, ignore the demand. I'm not ignoring anything. The buyer, the first buyer says, fix this stuff for $5,000. I'm not ignoring it and saying, okay, buyer, go away. Now I'm going to sell to the second buyer. I can't ignore that. I've got to terminate that first one. It's not to say that I have to fix it. And certainly that was one of the options here is, is, um, Answer D is we're not doing the repairs and still go forward. Uh, but at the end of the day, we're not ignoring that first demand and then going ahead with the second uh, buyer. That would put us in a bad position because we have not resolved the situation with the first buyer. So that is why the answer is B, that we don't or that it says ignore it, ignore the demand and then sell it to the second buyer anyway. Uh, next question. You ready for this? I always like to throw in, I like to pepper in a math question for you just because it's fun, because I like math. And I know all of you hate that word. It's like a four letter word to you, I know. Uh, so it goes like this. This has to deal with depreciation of property. And the math is actually very simple. It's a concept that a lot of people either aren't taught or whatever it is, I don't know, but I find a lot of people miss, if they get this kind of a question, they miss it for a very simple reason. The question says, an appraiser determines that a subject prop, I'm sorry, that a 30 year old subject property has a replacement cost of $185,000 and is on a parcel of land worth $47,000. So it's got a replacement cost of 185,000, meaning I can rebuild this thing brand new for 185,000 and it's on a piece of land worth $47,000. <clears throat> Question goes on to say, the structure's accrued depreciation is estimated at approximately 40%. So it's depreciated at 40%. Given this information, how would you calculate the current property's value? So this is very simple. What we're saying here is a couple of things. Again, we have a, a home that can be built brand new, a replacement cost of $185,000. And we have that land that's $47,000 and the property has de depreciated by 40%. So there's a couple of ways to do this. But the way that I like to work through this first is that we have to recognize and remember that land is not depreciable. We never include that. And in fact, the first answer that's what they're suggesting that you would do uh, is that I'm going to add 185,000 to that $47,000 number. I put those together and I work the depreciation that way. And I've already taken a misstep because when we depreciate property, it is only on the improvements. In this case, this residence, it is never, ever, ever on the land. That $47,000 is still worth $47,000. It is not depreciated. So I cannot include that. So really what we're working with here is that residence that's $185,000. So then from there, the rest of it's relatively easy. And again, there's two ways to do this. What I can do is figure out what the depreciation is. So I would take 185,000 and multiply it times that 40% and then subtract that from 185,000. But another way to make this a little bit easier to avoid two different math equations here is that if the property has depreciated by 40%, doesn't that mean that the property is worth 60% of that $185,000? That 40,000 of it's gone, I'm sorry, not 40, 40% of it has gone away, that that part's depreciated. So what I'm going to do is take $185,000 and multiply it times 60%. And when I do that on your calculator, if you've got one real quick, you'll find that you get $111,000. So that is the value of the improvements that brand new, it's $185,000. But because it's depreciated 40%, that means it has 60% of its value still left. So 185 times 60% gets me that 111,000. And now I add back in the lot. That lot still is part of the valuation. So I take the $111,000, add it to the $47,000, and I get the answer of $158,000. So that is the value of this property. The answer A, just for whatever it's worth to you, was 139,200, and that is the wrong one. And that is where people have made the mistake where they add the 185 
and they add the 47,000 code, but their, 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 their answer there, and then multiply it times the 60%, and they get the answer A, and that's the wrong way to do it. Remember that land is not depreciable. We separate that out in this depreciation calculation. So that is what that is. <clears throat> oh, yeah, there you go. Sarah, just put it in the chat if anybody wants to follow along with that. Look at that. See, she's good for something. <laughs> Uh, just kidding. Um, maybe a little bit. Uh, the next question. This is one that I've seen across many boards, and 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 I've answered it a couple of times. So forgive me for the repetitiveness, but not everybody has seen this. And and uh, um, it's a very simple concept. You just have to, I say, read into the question. It's not even that. It's reading the question of what it's saying. So it goes like this: A real estate broker enters into an agreement to represent a buyer who is seeking a property to purchase. What does that mean? That means that I have an agency agreement with this buyer. I am working with this buyer. I've entered into an agreement to work with this buyer. It goes on to say that this agent remains a single agent throughout the transaction. What does that mean? That means that I only represent the buyer. I do not represent the seller or any other party, not that there would be another party, but the seller in this transaction. So I'm an agent for the buyer. I remain a single agent, which means that I only represent the buyer. So that tells me everything I need to know to answer this next part, which is the where the question concludes, is it says a seller with whom this broker negotiates is the broker's what? So, and so going through the question again, I represent the buyer. I am a single agent. I remain a single agent, meaning I'm not a dual agent or limited agent or anything like that. I only represent the buyer, but I'm working with the seller that's negotiating with my buyer. Who is that seller to this broker? Answer A is client. Answer B is principal. Answer C is customer. And answer D is fiduciary. And I've seen this circulate around a lot. And if you pick A, B, or D, you're picking not only the wrong answer, but you're picking the same answer. This question is so easy if you remember your definitions that as a client, I am also, I'm sorry, let me say it this way, that a client is also a principal and also the fiduciary. So I can't be client, principal, and fiduciary. Those aren't three different people. So just by virtue of that, I know that they're not an answer because if I picked A, then I have to pick B and I have to pick D because they're all the same thing by definition. A client is a principal and a principal is a fiduciary and so on and so forth. They're all three the same. So if I pick one, I've got to pick the other two, which obviously I'm not doing. The answer here though too is C, customer. Because if I am a buyer's agent, and I only represent this buyer's agent. I'm a single agent. I do not represent the seller. This seller is not my client. They're not my principal. They're not my fiduciary. They are my customer. So again, a lot of people got that wrong. And most, most people have picked the term client because they read the question says the buyer, the broker is negotiating with this broker. I'm sorry, I said that wrong, that the broker is negotiating with the seller rather. Uh, and, and that does not mean I represent them. Again, Maybe some of you have been through this process, not necessarily as an agent, but in the purchase of a home or something like that, that as an agent, if I represented one of you, one of you are my buyers, I'm going to probably talk to the seller, especially in a for sale by owner situation and negotiate with this, with this seller on your behalf. I do not represent the seller. I have no obligations to them necessarily from the standpoint of agency. I represent my buyer, I represent you. So this seller is a customer. They are not a client. And again, by default, not a principal and also by default, not a fiduciary. So there is that one, <clears throat> excuse me. Ah. Yeah, going through these quickly. All right, again, if you guys have any questions, feel free to, to, ch uh, to chat or whatever you wanna do there. All right, next question that I have. A borrower has defaulted on a loan. Which of these following describes the rights the lender has in this situation? So we have a borrower, borrowed money. They are in default. They haven't made their payments, whatever the situation is. What rights does the lender have? What is the best right that the lender has? That's always one of the fun 
parts of these questions, which is the best answer here. It's not necessarily that there's not more than one answer, just which is the best answer. Answer A, the acceleration clause in the note gives the lender the right to have all future installments due and payable immediately. Answer B, the escalation clause in the note allows the lender to collect all future interest due on the loan should the buyer default. Answer C, the defeasance clause in the note stipulates that the lender may begin foreclosure proceedings to collect the remaining mortgage balance. Or answer D, the alienation clause in the note allows the lender to convey the mortgage to a buyer at a foreclosure sale. So, couple of things here. Anytime we're talking about default, by definition, we have to remember that we're talking about the acceleration clause. That's what the acceleration clause does. When the buyer, I'm sorry, when the borrower does not do what they promised, that is called a default. And so the automatic thing we have to remember, keep in our head, is that they are enacting what's called the acceleration clause. That's what that is. So these other answers don't matter. So the answer here obviously is A, because the other ones are not acceleration clause. I will go through them here in a minute, but the acceleration clause is the answer to this question. That is what, that, that's the, when default happens, the acceleration clause is triggered, meaning that they're accelerating all your payments, pay them all right now. You do not get the next 30 years or whatever it is you have on your mortgage to pay. Now, the escalation clause really has nothing to do with the mortgage, so I'm going to skip that one. But the defeasance clause, I saw a few people online pick defeasance clause, and I think they picked it because they just didn't know what it meant. <laughs> so, so I'll describe it for you here, not that it's part of the answer, but just so that you remember what it is. The defeasance clause actually does not benefit the lender, and that's another part of why this help, it, it helps with this answer is that the question asked, which of the following does the sell, I'm sorry, which of the following does the lender have the right to? The defeasance clause is not a lender right. This is a borrower's right. What it says is that when the, when the borrower borrowed money from the bank, the bank placed some form of a lien on this property. And when the mortgage is paid off, the defeasance clause works to the benefit of the borrower and says, you must remove that lien. So the defeasance clause is not for the lender. So that knocks it out of contention anyway, but it, it, it's a borrower protection that says, when you pay this off, uh, a, a bank take the lien away. So that's what the defeasance clause says. Now, answer D is the other one that I do see some people mention too, talks about the alienation clause. And the reason they do it, I think is for two reasons. One is that it is similar to it's similar to the acceleration clause because it requires all the payments to be made. Um, the other reason why I think is because it also starts with A, acceleration and alienation. But outside of that, you need to remember what the alienation clause, what triggers it. The alienation clause gets triggered when you alienate the property, which alienate means I have moved out. I have sold this property. I'm no longer in the in, in this space. I don't occupy this space. I've sold it. Somebody else does, or I've rented it out. So alienation clause is similar to the acceleration clause. It When it gets triggered, the bank says, pay us off. But the difference is, is the acceleration clause kicks in when you're in default the alienation clause is triggered or kicks in when you've sold the property or moved out of the property. So that's what that is. Uh, Lizzie, I see you asked a question. Keep getting confused about what the different lending programs as they pertain to different government programs. Any recommendations or memory tools there? No. And actually, I, I'll be honest, Lizzie, I don't like these questions. And the reason for that is, is that the rules have changed. I will tell you that when these programs were created, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and Ginny Mae all had a very limited scope. So that's where these questions come from. They're, they're questions, quite frankly, that are about 15 years too late. 15 years ago, the answer would have been very specific that FH, I'm sorry, that Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, Ginny Mae, they focused only on certain types of loans. But I will tell you over the past 10 to 12, 15 years, all of them are just now a blend of them all. Fannie Mae buys stuff that Ginny Mae used to buy exclusively. So to, again, not a good memory tip, 
but Ginnie Mae historically would purchase FHA and VA loans. They were the primary one that bought them. So if you had a borrower, for, rather more specifically, if a bank made an FHA or VA loan, Ginnie Mae bought most of them. But in today's world, and for the ever since the recession of 2008, 2009, that's how long it's been. Uh, so it's whatever, 13, 14, 15 years now. Um, Fannie Mae has been buying FHA and VA loans. So any question that you get on that, I'm going to, I, I, I hate to say it because I don't know for a fact, it's probably from an old test bank. I would be shocked if you saw it on the state exam. I don't want to take away and say that you won't because there is some historical component to that. Uh, but, but, but yeah, there's not really anything in today's world because they all just buy whatever. So again, that doesn't answer your question directly. Um, but I, I mean, I don't know. Is that answering your question and the best that I can given today's world? And, and I think probably an old test bank that you may be seeing or that I, <laughs> I hate to be disparaging to other schools, but not all schools have kept up with the times uh, has been my experience in teaching this all over. And so maybe, maybe that's what you're seeing. Certainly. I mean, again, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, those are all national organizations. So this is not state specific. I'm surprised they're even asking it. So that doesn't help at all. I know. Thanks, Brian. Sign up here and get nothing from you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, the next question um, is, is, was a good one. It always deals with water or dealing with water rights. Um, and certainly uh, in, in, in some states, you guys don't deal with water rights very often. In Indiana, we deal with it a little bit, but uh, I've got students, again, that we've helped in, in Arizona and California and, and other arid regions where water rights are a huge deal. Uh, so that's why I always like to bring it up. Um, so the, the, the question, the first question I have uh, goes over this from the standpoint of asking about when, or rather it says, under what circumstances would it be most important to advise a buyer to investigate the water rights to a property? So again, this is one of those, which is the best answer. I would argue that all three have some importance here uh, that I'm going to go through, but which of the one has the most significance to somebody with regard to water rights? The first one is answer A, condominium where the buyer wants to know the annual water bill. I hope that you know to throw that one out. When we're talking about water rights, we're not talking about a water utility bill. That's not what water rights are gonna deal with. So I can throw that out immediately. Talks about water and certainly as a buyer, I would be concerned, what is the water bill? I wanna know how much I'm gonna have to pay, but this is not a water rights issue. This is simply a utility issue that's not has nothing to do with water rights in this regard. Answer B is one that a lot of people would give a guess on. Uh, it is a buyer looking for a residential home with a domestic well. Certainly, that would be important. I mean, the well is going to be something that's dug down, and I'm probably in some sort of an underground river or some other sand bank where there's water down below. So water rights might be it. But remember that the question asks, which is the best answer, which is what throws answer B out. And so the correct answer is C. And that is a buyer looking for a home in a subdivision with a lake or a pond. That is going to be the most notorious or the, the most common issue where we're worried about water rights. It's going to be what is going on with this lake. I have a property that is adjacent to that abuts up to this pond, to this water thing, whatever. That's where your water rights are typically going to fall under. Certainly, again, I would argue that answer B is my strong backup, but the question is asking which is the most likely reason or what would be the most common reason why you'd be concerned, and it's going to be regarding that lake. Now, with that, now this does not get into, the que into this question. I'm just going on a tangent here for a minute because a lot of people will ask me this. What is the difference between littoral and, and uh, uh, riparian rights? And here is where I'm going to tell you the, the very general definitions, but I will tell you that every state deals with these differently, and it deals with a lot of different variables too. So there's not a good way to memorize all this other than what I'm going to tell you now, and that is to say that riparian rights deals with flowing bodies of water, like rivers and, and, and streams and creeks, creeks and things like that. So 
a good memory tip for that is that the, the word riparian starts with the letter R and river starts with the letter R. So when I'm thinking about riparian, I'm thinking about flowing bodies of water, thinking of like the Mississippi, or we have the White River here in Indiana, other states, the Ohio River, if you're in Kentucky, you know, Indiana, Ohio, that area stuff like that. So those are flowing bodies of river, or I'm sorry, flowing bodies of water that are riparian rights, where littoral rights are for standing bodies of water, like lakes and ponds and oceans, things like that. Uh, so R, yeah, Sarah just put it in there. L littoral is, is another, starts with L, lakes starts with L. And what all these questions deal with, and again, though, that's the, that's the, 60,000 viewpoint or 60,000 foot viewpoint of both topics. What this really gets into is things like doctrine of prior appropriation, which if you're for one of those states, you know what I'm talking about, or hopefully at least you've heard about it. Where, uh, <laughs> and, and I thought this was hilarious. Uh, my wife and I recently started watching the show Yellowstone. Uh, so if you're a Yellowstone fan, you're going to dive in on this. You're going to be like, oh my gosh, John Dutton did that thing. You remember in the in the show Yellowstone, there's a casino owner that's trying to move in there and they needed water to make the casino work. Well, John Dutton, well, allegedly, John Dutton uh, used some dynamite, blew up the river that went through this thing and diverted it so it went through his land now. That obviously caused this casino to not be able to open. And that was the whole point of it. And that's why water rights are so important because especially with those riparian rights, particularly when we're talking about flowing bodies of water, the river may come across my land, but it goes far down from me. And if I do something, put a dam up or do something, that's gonna infringe upon a lot of people. So that's why this is so important and certainly uh, to farmers and, and arid and, and really dry areas. I mean, shoot, I mean, <laughs> uh, 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 Lizzie, you talked about being in California. I know you guys are having issues with, 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 with water and all that out there and stuff like that. And, and other states too, Texas and whatnot. Um, those are all huge issues in those areas of who can use what, how much. And a lot of times the government steps in and deals with those water rights. So that's, that's the general idea of what we're getting into. Now I see a couple of you asking questions. Debbie, you asked, speaking about water, waterfront, any tricks to remember the, de the definitions of uh, 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 um, accretion, evulsion? I'm, I, I'll be honest, I've never heard I've never heard of alluvion or affian. I'm sorry, I have not. I can look those up for you. Um, I'll, I'll write them down. I'm, I'm just not familiar. I've never heard the term alluvion. Yep, this was in our um, Massachusetts book. Okay. I have never heard those before. I'm going to look them up. So I, I won't be able to answer you on those. I'm sorry, but I will absolutely oh, look no those worries. up. And so um, I'll be recording a new podcast. A loop. On I couldn't figure it out. I, I will I will dive into it. I will find out an answer for you. So <laughs> I won't be able to answer it on this one, but I will be recording a new podcast episode on Monday. And Debbie, I'm going to call you out so you can listen to it. I'm going to say, Debbie, from the East Coast, represent, not Red Sox fan, unfortunately, <laughs> but here's your answer. <laughs> so Thank I will you. get you that answer and you'll listen to it on, the, on that episode when I have that come out. Now, with regard to accretion and avulsion, I can answer that. And so, and, and with that, I'd like to add in another term, erosion. The reason I'm bringing it up is that erosion and accretion are the same, are, I'm sorry, are, are, are related to each other. Erosion is the slow loss of land because of the movement of water. Accretion is the slow buildup of that. So they work kind of opposite of each other. I have a, a lot and you have a lot next door to me. If I am losing some dirt, that dirt goes someplace. And if it's accumulating for, to you, I'm losing it. But somewhere downstream, somebody's collecting it. I suffer from erosion. That person that gets it is, is benefiting from uh, accretion. So I don't have a good memory tip for that, but maybe just remembering, because most people know what erosion is. You've heard of it before. You know that erosion means I'm slowly losing dirt. So if you remember that, the opposite of that is accretion where I'm gaining the dirt. Now, avulsion is similar to erosion from the standpoint that I'm losing, but avulsion 
as a sudden loss, like with a flood or a tidal wave or earthquake, some massive major uh, meteorological event or you know active nature of some sort. And Mother Nature is mad at us for whatever reason and causes this horrible cataclysmic event and we lose our land because of that. So avulsion and erosion are the same from the standpoint that I'm losing some part of my my lot, my parcel, my whatever it is, but avulsion is a sudden, it happened, a tidal wave came in and washed it away, or earthquake, or yeah, something like that, flood does that, so yeah, not great memory tips, but that's what those are. Okay, um, thank you. You're welcome. The, um, avulvian and affiant, those were, you know, um, answers A and B, and I was just really confused. Well, I, I wonder, um, oh, Lizzie just typed in here, alluvian, the increase of soil and shore. As a result of accretion, okay, I maybe I, I'm I'm trusting Lizzie here. I have no reason to doubt her, uh, but I've just not vetted it. I just want to make sure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I'm willing to stake that it's. <clears throat> it looks like alluvian and accretion are the same thing. Um, so yeah, I don't I don't know, but I I'll look that up. But that I've I've just never heard of that before. So thank you, thank you for looking that up, Lizzie. All right, um, thanks to all. Appreciate you're welcome. it. You're welcome. Of course. Happy, I'd love the, the help on everything. Did I answer everybody's question? I think that I did. Okay. All right. The next question that I have for you, and this is one that I, I love to talk about because there's so much debate. And I don't mentioned this on the podcast before, but this was another twist on the voidable versus void contract. It says an intoxicated buyer made an offer on a house and that offer was accepted by the owner. This contract is what? A, illegal, B, void, C, unilateral, or D, voidable. So we have somebody that is drunk off their ass. <laughs> now it says intoxicated, but you know what I mean. They are drunk, made an offer while intoxicated, and that offer was accepted by the seller. What is this contract? It is not illegal. By definition, then, it is not void. Void means illegal. When you think of void, when you hear it, I don't care how they present it in the question unless it is just blatantly obvious that this thing is illegal to do. I will buy your house if you murder my ex-wife. Now, I'm not saying that you do that. Please just be clear. But that would be illegal, right? We're entering a contract for you to do something illegal. Murder this person. Do this illegal thing. That is a void contract. That's going to be almost the only time that you see a void or illegal contract when the, the purpose, the intent, the design behind it is illegal. There's nothing illegal about being intoxicated and signing a contract. It's stupid. You shouldn't have done it, but there's nothing illegal about it. So by definition, it is not void. Again, some of the questions that get asked to I me, mean, not this one particularly, but one like this and many others that people have brought up to me, they're, I think it's void, Brian. It seems like it's void. I think it's void and it's not. To be void, it has to be illegal, that we're doing something that we cannot do. It's illegal to do. Not that we don't want to do it or we wouldn't like to do it or eh, this thing. It is clear that it cannot happen. So that throws out answers A and B. Now, some people picked unilateral here, and this is not a unilateral contract because this is a purchase contract. In order to be a unilateral contract, it'd have to be a situation where one of the parties have started out with the idea that I can back out of this if I want to. So that is not what we have here. A purchase contract is not a unilateral contract. Having said that, here's the twist on this and what makes this annoying for some of you is that the answer is D, it's voidable. That is the answer here. This contract is voidable, meaning that this buyer, the one that was drunk, has the right to back out. So it has the element of a unilateral contract, but it wasn't created as a unilateral contract. This drunk person, I would bet, is not going here. I'm going to drink myself silly and go into a contract because I want to make it voidable. That wasn't the intent. Avoidable, I'm sorry, a, a unilateral contract is one that we designed it that way. We wanted it to be that way, like a lease option, a purchase option, stuff like that. There are uh, there are unilateral contracts that are out there, but a purchase contract under this circumstance is not a unilateral contract. It does give the buyer 
the right to back out. They could say, you know what? I was drunk. I didn't know what I was doing. I want to back out of it. So that means voidable. It does not mean unilateral. Unilateral is going to be something different than that. So the answer to this one is voidable. So again, a lot of people miss this and other questions like it because they start to question the idea of what void means. And void is very specific. We're talking illegal stuff. And what, what I've talked about before on the podcast and, and, and many classes is that unless it is just blatantly obvious that it is illegal to do, always, always default to voidable. Don't talk yourself out of it. Don't say, well, yeah, but this, oh, well, gosh, yeah, that. Hey, they, they, somebody forged my name on this. That is not, it by, not in theory, uh, illegal if the person accepts it. If my wife signed my name to sell our house and I was okay with it, technically she broke the law from the standpoint that she forged my name, but I don't care. I wanted to sell the house. I wasn't there. She signed for me. Was it the right thing to do? No. Any more than being drunk and going into a contract was not the right thing to do, but it wasn't illegal to do. So that's why it's not void. So most of the, I would say pretty much every question that I've seen, anybody's ever presented to me, the answer is almost always voidable. And it's just clearly blatantly obvious that it's illegal to do. Uh Oh, De Debbie, you, so for those of you that are, wanted to follow along, that she put in there uh, the question that she read, I, uh, the, the size of a waterfront lot may be increased. Oh, okay. Maybe increased by all the following, except um, then, it, then, then the answer would be uh, uh, avulsion. So if you guys are reading in the, in the, in the chat there, it says the, the size of a waterfront lot may be increased by all the following, except uh, which... Again, Lizzie, thanks to you and your definition, I'm pulling that up. Uh, alluvian and affiant. Uh, I, I, I'm probably completely butchering these words. Affiant or affiant or whatever that is. And accretion, all gain property, all gain dirt, if you will. Avulsion is that sudden loss. So the answer to that question then is going to be avulsion because that's the loss of land where the others are, um, are, uh, are uh, um, gaining. So thank you. Thank you. All thank right. You. I, I just time. wanted to put context to no, no, thank the you. answers thank I you. couldn't figure out. Yeah, no, I, I, you know, that's, that's, I've just never heard those terms before. I, I mean, I've been doing this since 1995. And uh, anytime I hear a new term, it's, it's, it's very interesting to me. It's I, as I was teasing at the beginning of the thing, I'm, I'm jumping into law school here in August. And uh, it would be funny if I learn this in law school and I'm going to credit all of you on here. Like, I know what that is, professor. This is really cool. Where before I would have been like, I have no clue what that is. <laughs> no, no. I, I know what accretion is. I know what avulsion is and all that. All right. Uh, last question that I have, unless anybody else has anything. Uh, also, Philip, I'm sorry. I didn't mean if you're still, yeah, you're still on here. Philip, at the very beginning, you asked about one of the test questions. Uh, I can't go over test questions for two reasons. One, um, I'm not allowed to share them. Uh, but but two, I don't even have it anyway. <laughs> so unfortunately, I don't have uh, that test question with me. If you remember the context of it, I'm happy to go through it, but I don't have the test question. So I didn't want you to think, Philip, that I was ignoring you on that. I just remember that I hadn't discussed your question. And those are the reasons why. So here is the last question. And, and, and uh, um, uh, it's one that, that I've seen a couple different variations of it goes like this, an elderly couple is represented by a broker who does not hold any professional license other than that as a broker. The couple finds a home they want to purchase and ask the broker's advice about how to take title, explaining that they want to be sure that when one of them dies, the other will automatically become the sole owner of the home. So what are we talking about here? You guys, we kind of talked about this a little bit already, that if I want to ensure that they can get the home, what kind of things are you thinking about? I thinking about joint tenancy, aren't you? Maybe tenancy by the entirety, if you remember that, which is a form of ownership with, with of married couples. So those are some of the things you might offer. The question asks though, which would be the least appropriate for you to choose? So that's where people have missed this question because there's other questions that would say, which might be the most appropriate or they'll add in some other variable here. So the context of the question hasn't changed. It's just, what is it asking for? And this particular question says, which of the following is least appropriate for the broker to do? 
So the answers are this. A, recommend that they consult with, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, yeah. Recommend that they consult a real estate attorney about the best way to ensure this outcome. That sounds pretty reasonable. I think I would want to do that. So that's not the least appropriate. That's going to be pretty appropriate to do. The next answer, explain that this is a complex matter that is beyond his expertise. That's also reasonable too. There's a lot of things to know about joint tenancy, tenancy in common. I know you guys have had questions about it. And with regard to this, I might be able to throw a few things out there, but I'm going to say even, even talking to a client, I'll say, hey, here's a couple of things to know, but it's really beyond what I know. So we need to find an expert here. Uh, the next answer is explain the basic differences between uh, forms of joint ownership uh, and suggest they consult with a real estate professional. So again, that sounds like an appropriate thing to say. The last answer is the correct answer. It's the thing that you should not do. It is this. Recommend that they take title as joint tenants and tenancy by the entirety to, enjoy, to ensure the desired outcome. If you remember, the question started off that I am representing this person and I have no other professional license other than as a broker, meaning I am not an attorney. I am not an accountant. I am not trained on these. I know some stuff. I can talk about joint tenancy a little bit. I can talk about tenancy by, you know, by the entirety and in common and all that. But all the other answers were reach out to a consultant, talk to an expert, talk to this person. That's going to be the most appropriate me saying, hey, I got you. I know all there is to know about ownership, even though I have no knowledge of it. I have no background in it. Uh, tell me what to do here. And I tell them that would be the least appropriate thing to do would be to tell them how to take ownership. Should never do that. Explain to them a little bit about it. Talk about experts. Talk about things to be concerned about. But at the end of the day, we are not an expert on this. This would be an attorney and possibly an accountant question. So those are the things I have. So it is 8.05. It's pretty much my time. But again, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to take those on. Um, if you've not been to our website, I recommend that you do that. Uh, uh, we have added some more stuff. We've got uh, another surprise coming up, I think, March 15th. Uh, that we'll be adding to the site. That's the target date, I should say, for this. And we'll certainly make a news uh, or a post about it and all that. So be looking for that. But we're adding some more stuff. So make sure you're following us on, on all our channels, on Facebook, on Instagram. Sarah, uh, she's been doing some crazy TikTok stuff. She's, she's making me do videos, guys. It's terrible. I hate, I'm just kidding. I love videos. Uh, I just like to tease her about it. Uh, but anyway, um, um, going through all that stuff, just follow us on everything. Uh, oh, Sarah, you just chimed in here. Uh, please provide the math. Oh, yes. Math formula to determine monthly HOA payments for a small condo association. You One unit is 804 feet. Ah. Uh, I am not following what the question is. I'm sorry, Deb. Um, the math formula for determining monthly HOA payments. Again, in my math book, this was one of the questions because in the state of Massachusetts, there were eight math questions. And it basically said I had to figure out the monthly HOA payments for three or four condos with different square feet Okay. with each condo. Here's how you'll do this generally. And I need to know a little bit more information, but, but what they're looking at is it's a form of proration but the proration is based upon size. So to do this, what they're probably, I'm going to assume some things here is that they have given an expense budget or something. I'm gonna make it up. Let's say $10,000. And they're saying, split this up equally based upon size. So the way that you would figure that up is this. You will add up all of the units together. So in your example, you have one at 804, one at 773, and you have one at 1057. So I'm adding all three of those up and coming up with the total number. And then I'm going to divide each of these units. So let's, in fact, let's just go ahead and do it real quick. So I, because I've got it right here, I've got my calculator. So we have, um, oh, forgive me, uh, 804 plus 773 plus 1057. So I get 2634, yep, yep, right there. 2634 mm -hmm. is what I get as the total. What I'm going to do, write that down, 2634. What I need to know is what percentage of each unit does it compare to that? So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to take um, 804 is the first one and divide that by that total number, 2634. And what that tells me 
is that I have roughly 30.5% for that unit of the entire expense that unit one at 804, their expense is 30.5% of that bill. Then I'm going to do the same thing to unit two. I'm going to take 773, divide that by the 2634, the total, and that gives me 29.34. Okay. 29.3, let's just round it that way. And then the last one is 1,057, divide that by 2634, and that gets me 40.1% roughly. So then I take that bill, that $10,000 bill in my example, and multiply it times each of those percentages, and that is how you would do that. So the, the key part of this is simply adding all the unit square footages together and then mm -hmm. divide them all individually into the aggregate number to get that percentage and then multiply that percentage times whatever the bill is. That's how you would do that. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, let's see here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, great. Awesome, guys. Appreciate the information. Again, if there's anything I can do to help you, please reach out to me. Please email me, brian at aha.reep.com. -E go to our website, go to our YouTube channels, go to our everything. We got stuff for you guys. We're helping you out and loving doing it. So that's it for me tonight. Take care, guys, and have a legendary day. Thank you.